welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Turn the Page podcast. My name is Jessica. I am one of your hosts today. Uh, my co-host is... Jen. Hello, everyone. And we're so excited about this interview and this author and this book. This was a book that as soon as just the cover and the title came across our screen, we're like, yes, must have it, must read it. And then we read it and it was incredible. So yeah. So um, please introduce yourself and tell us about Her Majesty's Royal Coven. I would love to. Thank you for having me. Um, My name is Juno Dawson. I am the author of Her Majesty's Royal Coven. It's the story of five very powerful witches who have known each other since childhood. Now they're grown up, they're in their 30s. Um, Some of them work for the official coven of the United Kingdom and others don't. I'm sorry about the building work that's happening outside my apartment. There's nothing I can do about that, sorry. just adds flavor. It makes me it makes me feel like a real person, doesn't it? Um, but the novel the novel concerns what happens when the oracles of Her Majesty's Royal Coven predict an apocalyptic end of which kind, and then there is an ideological split between this group of friends about how they should tackle the problem, and it threatens not just their friendship group, but it threatens the whole universe. Um, so I absolutely loved this book. It was. Oh my gosh, it was absolutely riveting. I read it in like a, a day and a half. It was just oh, so thank fun. you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I was most interested in because I'm a um I was a medieval historian before I was a library worker. And I love how it uses actual history and um, you know, talks about the sort of the magic bubbling under the surface of all of the events that we know. And um, I was wondering if we could start. Uh, with you maybe talking a little bit about how you um, how you decided to incorporate Anne Boleyn and the Tudor court and how that worked into your whole uh, alternate history. I think I think it gives it such depth. Is what what I when you when you're doing witches of empires, I think you have just this golden opportunity to start in the modern day, but fully understand that this is something that has got centuries of history behind it. It means that my characters who are modern, young, millennial women, it means that they just have a backstory even beyond their personal backstory. And of course, when you're writing from the United Kingdom, you know, what could be more English than exploring the royal family? And of of course, Anne Boleyn in particular is such an enigma. You know, we know so little about her because after she was executed, you know, there there was a real concerted attempt to kind of erase her from history. And of course, that has such modern echoes with the notion of erasure or cancellation, you know. The rumours have existed for generations that Anne Boleyn was in some way involved in the occult or the esoteric. Personally, do I believe that? No, I think it's probably an attempt to discredit Mm -hmm. somebody that the monarch wanted dead. But it's way more fun if we believe she was a witch. Like, and and that's kind of the starting point. So, you know, when, you know, there will be, I have no doubt as we move through the world of Her Majesty's Royal Coven, there will be other historical figures who it's suggested a part of this long dynasty of witches as well, going well before Anne Boleyn, as we will explore in book two. But I shall, I'm not going to say anything about book two now. It's too soon, too soon for book two. (laughs) I loved, I I was about to say I loved all the characters, but uh, not so much. Um, I loved (laughs) most of the characters. I I know who you mean. I know who you mean. Yes. But we'll t- we'll talk about her in a bit because I've got a soft spot for her as well. Yeah, yeah I was really, uh, and this is not to give spoilers, but I was really surprised and like by like just sort of like her start to, to the end of the book. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I don't want to say any more than that because that will spoil things. But uh, so you have these childhood friends, you have um, 
Helena, Neve, Kara, uh, Leone, and Elle. Um, and they were Spice Girls fans as one was back in the day of that age. And uh, they all had powers and they all came from different, different um, households, but maybe not so much some as others. Like um, Leone came from, uh, she's black and she comes from um, a household that sort of frowned upon her magical abilities. She's also gay um, and um, you find that out. And that's not so much a spoiler. You find that out fairly yeah, early after yeah, yeah. you meet her uh, as a child. Um, and then you see them all as adults. And it's interesting because I feel like it, it is very much how like a tight friend group would would change and kind of see their ideals change. But you do have that witchcraft background. Um, and it also leads me for a question that Jen and I were both curious about. Uh, one of their mentors is named Annie Device. Is that mm -hmm. a reference to Good Omens? So, now, here's something I learned in my research. That surname is pronounced Devis. Oh my! Not so. Yeah, I know. Wow. So I I was saying device for a long, long time because obviously a kitchen device. But right. no, no, it's it's when it's a name in in Yorkshire or Lancashire, it's Devis. And the reason that Neil Gaiman and I have both used that surname is because one of the women killed at the Pendle Witch Trials was a Devis. So, however, the youngest the youngest Devis, Jeanette Devis, um, survived. And so it figured, I, I think it figured to be me and Gaiman alike, that potentially there were still Pendle witches from that dynasty who were alive. So yes, yeah, so Annie Devis is a nod to, a nod to the very real women who were killed in Pendle in the 17th century. Wow. That's something uh, that I did not know. Well, so yeah, I mean, because obviously you, you had your own Salem witch trials, you know, and, and kind of, and I think, so that's the thing. So I, I can't imagine that the Pendle witch trials would be as well known in the States. But yeah, they were, they were one of many, many witch trials that existed under King James I, um, mm. Elizabeth's, oh, let me get this right, Elizabeth, I want to say great nephew, I think he was, because obviously there was a succession crisis after Elizabeth. Um, yeah, and he really, he really wasn't a fan of witches. And of course, he wrote, he wrote a treatise on witch finding. So, um, yeah, the Devis, the Devis family, although they're an interesting story in themselves, I would say to listeners, there's, there's plenty out there on YouTube and plenty of material about the Devises, because actually the thing that Salem and Pendle had in common, and what they both have in common with Her Majesty's Royal Coven, is that women slash witches are in grave danger when they turn on each other mm -hmm. because the Pendle witch trials are a key example of what happens when basically it was two different families trying to sell each other out to the authorities they were all executed it's, and there, there is a lesson to be learned there for the characters in Her Majesty's Royal Coven as well and that's really I guess what the book's about it's about female coalition but it's more fun if we say it's about witches yeah, actually, one of the um, things that I really loved about this book is how, you know, this conflict kind of comprises um, an external battle against um, demonic forces, as well as sort of like um, fascistic magic wielders, you know, who um, who have a very different vision of, of what the world should look like in the relationship between witches and the mundane. But that is um, unfolding alongside this very internal conflict among witches about um, inclusion and uh, identity and who, who gets to say who we are or what our identity is. And the way that those two conflicts feed into each other and are like essential to each other is fantastic. You know, I, I, it's just riveting. <laughs> And that, that's not an accident. I mean, that, that's very reassuring for me too, because that means that my intention for the novel has come across. So it's quite worrying when people are like, oh, and I just thought this was a novel about, you know, Anglo-French relations. And you're like, oh, no, it's not meant to be. But no, this really, it really is meant to be. And that's really what the whole trilogy is. So the first book in particular looks at division between women and conflict between women. And then the second and third book in particular, look at the role within women under the patriarchy more broadly. Um, and that's, you know, as a trans woman living in the United Kingdom, I am not deaf to 
the conversations that are happening around trans women in the British press. And this is, I'm glad that this is coming across to an American audience as well, because nowhere else in the world is having quite the situation we're having with the British press at the moment, which is when I come to America, when I go to Australia or most of the places in Europe, it's very political, which is the right tends to be anti-trans, the left tends to be very inclusive. Whereas in the United Kingdom, those lines are just skewed, you know, mm. and we've got some quite liberal news outlets trotting out some very transphobic rhetoric. And of course, I wrote HMRC during lockdown one. So I was stuck in my apartment listening to misinformation about trans people. And as an artist, of course, it was influencing what I wanted to write. But I didn't want to write a serious academic nonfiction text about the history of trans inclusion or the history of trans people. And actually those books have been written and they've been done incredibly well. I wanted to write a story about something that I loved, which is witchcraft and magic and sisterhood and solidarity and feminism. But also, you know, it came from that very simple what if. And I think all the best books come from a what if, which is what if a transgender witch tried to join a coven? let's let's go from there and and vitally as well kind of it was really important to me to explore it from the point of view of the cisgender women around that character um which is why the trans character no spoilers the trans character doesn't have a lot to say because because actually it's about the perception of trans people as much as it is trans people. But what I will say is the trans character has much more to say in book two and three. So uh, so just get no spoilers, no spoilers. (laughs) She's wonderful. She was such a lovable character. And there was just no way that uh, as the reader, you just didn't want to protect her at all costs. Um, And there's just a lot of chat within the book and it echoes just what you were just saying about how um, inclusion is sort of skewed and it's not as hard political as it is in other um, places uh, as to what constitutes feminism. Um, And there is a character which is definitely uh, what one would consider a turf um, and um, a gatekeeper on who mm-hmm. gets to be a wo- woman and who gets to determine what uh, based on just, you know, like she considers herself quote unquote open minded, but when she talks, not so much. Um, yeah. And you realize that and Unfortunately, her friends are realizing that this person that they thought maybe was a bit stuffy is actually quite horrible in some of um, her beliefs and a lot of her beliefs and rigid to the point that she will not bend. She will not open up just even that dialogue to be like, well, maybe you know, okay, maybe this is kind of how I perceived things or how like the wave of feminism I came into perceived things, but it's not necessarily correct. And maybe I should start listening. Um, How did you sort of decide, um, you know, when the conversations were going to come in? Mm. So that character, I don't know what say which of the characters it is, takes a turn for the worse. But she was as important to me as the other four in that I really, really wanted to try and understand where some of this rhetoric was coming from. Because I am surrounded by cisgender women in both my personal life and in my professional life who have done nothing but be supportive, who have helped me through the very difficult early years of my transition when my life was very much in turmoil. You know, I had this team of publicists and editors and friends and my mum and my sister. And it's only really when I go online 
that that I was experiencing this kind of transphobia but then then you know then I was finding myself in situations where where I was at a launch party and all of a sudden somebody would just leave and I'd be like did I was that something I said and they're like no it's just something you were you know and and so I I really wanted to sort of sit down and see if I could try not sympathize because I don't and I don't think we should ever sympathize with prejudice or bigotry but I wanted to see if I could fathom it and it was a valuable experience because by the end of it I realized oh it's just bigotry you know, I, I really did. I was like an archaeologist. I had my little brush, my little air squirter. I was brushing off the bones of all these kind of theories and, you know, kind of all the all the scaremongering and the fears. Because actually, I, I do think I will say that I think there are people in this world who are genuinely fearful of what trans people mean for women or for gender or for boys or for the binary. But I dug away and I examined it really, really closely and an unfounded fear about a minority group is a prejudice, <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, look at that. So, so actually it was, it was a really important journey for me to go on with that character because there was something in the back of my mind that did partly blame myself. I was like, you are a problem. You are a problem on this planet. You are causing a problem. And then I realized, actually, I'm not causing a problem. Um, I'm just living (laughs) as I'm living. And there are lots of people on this planet who are living. And then there are other people who have a problem with those people living. And actually, I think that's their problem, not my problem. Really quickly, I just wanted to mention, I have uh, just sort of written down in my notes. um, And I think it's really important to mention that this book is also very funny. At points, um, it's Thanks. very funny. I have written down, my, my notes say funny and compelling, like Buffy, but written with more care. Well, well, I mean, Buffy is remarkable for a show that wrote itself and had no creator. Um, um, do you know, one of, the, one of these days, our 90s heroes will just stop disappointing us, but sadly today is not that day. Um, I, I grew up on Buffy. I loved Buffy. Buffy made me who I am in, in so many ways. And it certainly made me the writer that I am. Um, I think it's it's a, about as perfect as a TV show can be. And, you know, obviously Willow was so important to me as a queer teenager as well. You know, re- really, Willow was one of the first times I saw sort of a queer character that I could really chime with in the 90s. And... and I've tried to write terribly, terribly serious novels. It just doesn't work. And I had, to, I had to figure that one out quite early on in my, my YA career, which is I just don't do serious very well. And, you know, in real life, people are funny, you know, and, and that's, why, that's why this novel is set in the real world. You know, I'm a huge fan. of I love me some kind of Samantha Shannon and sort of big, meaty fantasy novels. But I like fantasy that feels real. And so I think by setting Her Majesty's Royal Coven in a world that we all recognise it is, it's modern day England, 2022, but there are also witches. I just think it makes it feel realer. And actually, you know, even within high fantasy, even within Lee Bardugo or George R. R. Martin, characters are funny. People make each other laugh. And, And actually, I think if you experience the highs of those characters and the good times and the romantic bits and the funny bits when those characters are in peril you feel it more keenly because you just don't want them to die and I always think the best horror films are the the horror films where you deeply care for the characters because you care if they you care if they make it to the end or not absolutely and I think that you know that sort of balance between humor uh and uh, going through incredible struggle is something that also happens, you know, in the real world constantly for people who are, um, you know, experiencing uh, those sorts of things. Um, but speaking about the book feeling real, like one of the things that really made it feel so real to me was that it felt like such a more um, uh, vivid and real um, UK 
you know, um, and so much more diverse and inclusive, um, you know, if, if we were to compare it to another sort of big magical property, which also has no creator, um, like that one is very, um, it's very London and it's very posh, you know, and it's very like everybody's sort of the same, but this one has such a, um, you know, it's set in the North and it has uh, such a, a larger range of um, people from different countries within the UK and, and from places beyond that. And, you know, I think it's just so much more, um, believable yeah and Hebden Bridge is real I mean I've said this not everybody in America knows Hebden Bridge is a real place um, and I would say visit it's everything I wrote in the book about Hebden is true it's the lesbian capital of the United Kingdom it's where Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath lived it's, it's where Sylvia Plath is buried um it's beautiful and it doesn't make a lick of sense like I grew up 25 minutes from Hebden Bridge in Bradford which is nothing like Hebron Bridge. It's like an industrial mill town, you know? And, and so it doesn't make any sense. It shouldn't exist, but it does. And, and I think we have a word for that and it's magic. You know, there is just something a little bit magic about it, but you're right. I mean, I didn't know that Her Majesty's Royal Coven was gonna sell in the United States or across Europe. I'm very glad it has, but I hope that for people who haven't traveled the United Kingdom, it opens, the the gate to the fact that there is a whole United Kingdom that exists outside of London and the South that yes the North isn't perhaps always as pretty as the South but there's so much up there you know and, and book two there's a lot in Manchester I think Manchester is as cool a city as London I, I think if if your listeners get a chance to come to the UK make sure you take in the North and take in Scotland gosh Scotland is something very special so I have to say, um, I cannot wait for the next book in this series. I cannot wait. It's finished. I, I finished. Cannot I just wait. sent it to my editor last week. It's done. She's done. She's finished. When can we expect it? I think it'll be next summer. So I think we're going to do one a year just because we don't want to bring out two super close together. And then because I've not even started the third one. So um. Um, so I think we'll pace them. So yeah, book one this summer, book two next summer, and then book three, hopefully the summer after that. But, but let's see what happens next. Because there's so much I want to talk about, but I also can't because it, uh, other than what we talked about, it will just spoil the whole book. And that makes me very sad for people who might listen to this because you don't want this spoiled. You need to just sit down and read this book. Oh, thank you. Yes, there is, there is quite a big finish. Yeah. Sorry, Sov. <laughs> the actually really quickly um just the whole like backstory because there this is also one of those novels that sort of comes post magical war so mm -hmm. um a lot of times you know like um the characters will be present but you'll know that there was um, a magical war that came before uh is how much of that uh did you sort of map out or is it just sort of like this is a thing that happened, but we're going to talk about going forward. Hmm. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in that you should never start at the beginning, that you should always start halfway through a story. And it was important to me that those women came to page one with trauma. You know, I think everything that happens in this trilogy is these four women dealing with what has happened to them previously. And we do find out you know gradually drop wise we find out what has happened why they're so hardened you know Neve is so shut off living in her little routine Elle is in denial Helena has this rhino thick skin and Leonie is kind of she's kind of she's almost retreated from the rest of her friends she's kind of gone solo she, she's done the Mel B kind of she's she's done a Jerry she's done a ginger spice and so um and that's you know really Yes, it's about witches, but it's about those four characters. And it's it's really fun. Obviously, I'm two thirds of the way through this journey with them now, but I'm, I'm going to miss them. I don't want it to end. I think that's why I'm reluctant to start book three, because I just don't want it to finish ever. I know we have to close soon, um, but I just wanted to kind of give a nod. You're working in the Hooniverse, the Doctor Hooniverse. I am. So I've done, it's about, if you can get BBC Sounds app, Doctor Who Redacted, is available now. It's the first official scripted podcast. It's an audio drama starring Jodie Whittaker and um, the amazing Charlie Craig's a trans actress. 
and yeah what what a gig to be doing an official Doctor Who story um yeah check check it out it's it's again it's funny it's science fiction it's kind of it's perhaps not what people are expecting but um yeah it's what a dream come true it's been a long time coming as well we actually got the commission in 2019 and it's with the pandemic and everything it's taken two years to actually make it but yeah it's do you know what the finished podcast just police car going by apparently I live in a really noisy. I live in a very quiet town you wouldn't think it um <laughs> But yeah, I'm so happy with the finished product. I, I never dreamed it would be this good. You know, the, the sound, the acting, the direction, everything is so elevated. And I think if, if you love an audio drama and if you love Doctor Who, then I think it's every bit as good as the ones that are on TV. So check it out, check it out. Okay, well, I wanna thank you um, so much for coming to talk with us, to make the time. Um, this is a truly fantastic book um, for our listeners. This will be available um, at your nearest independent bookstore or library very soon, and you should definitely check it out. Um, and this is going to be goodbye from Jen and my co-host. Uh, Jessica and our guest. And Juno, thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you. you. And we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.